Perfect. All right. Well, it's just ticked over to midday, so I might get a start um, and anyone who comes through will be able to catch the presentation after a short introduction. So hi all and welcome to Stock Up Strategic Management of Internal Parasites in Cattle. It has just ticked over to midday, so we'll get a start. My name is Patrick MacDonald and I'm the Project Manager for StockSense. And today we are fortunate enough to have Dr. Leah Tyrrell and Dr. Job Webb. Dr. John Webb Ware joining us to discuss management of internal parasites in cattle. Before I hand over to Leah and John, I'll just give a brief overview of StockSense and run through some housekeeping. I'll also note that we're recording this webinar, so if you have to leave early for any reason, you will be able to access a recording of the webinar afterwards uh, and we'll email that out to everyone who's registered. To begin with, I'll just give a brief overview of StockSense. So StockSense is a producer-led extension program, which aims to help producers adopt animal health and production practices that improve animal welfare and maintain Victoria's biosecurity status. StockSense is funded by the Cattle Compensation Fund and the Sheep and Goat Compensation Fund, and is proudly delivered by the VFF. So what does StockSense have to offer you? So StockSense is open to all Victorian livestock owners and will give you access to face-to-face -face events across Victoria, webinars such as the one you're on today, social media channels, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, as well as other resources such as fact sheets and newsletter articles. On top of this, we're also a point of contact for all livestock producers if they have any questions regarding animal health, welfare, or biosecurity. Now, your feedback is important to us. Feedback from primary producers will help shape this project and ensure we are targeting what is most relevant to you. This will include some short surveys during and following our events. So to begin with, I'll just get everyone to answer some short questions, which will give us an idea of who you are and where you're from. Um, those questions should hopefully be popping up on your screen very soon. Yep, perfect, so they're there. So I'll just get everybody um, to fill those out and I'll just give you a few moments. Perfect, so I'll just give everyone a couple more moments to fill those out. And we'll shut that off in three, two, one. So I'll get that shut off now. Perfect. Um, so I can see the results here. It appears we've got a bit of a spread across Victoria. So that's great to see. Uh, and finally, just a bit of housekeeping. So we encourage you to ask questions today and you can use that using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So once Leah and John have finished their presentations, we'll go through any questions that have been asked. Uh, we do ask that you keep your questions applicable to everyone on the line today. We probably won't have time to go through any questions specific to your own situation. And finally, we just ask that you make sure that those questions remain respectful to our presenters online. So in finishing from me, please feel free to reach out. We're really looking forward to working with producers on the StockSense project. So there are just a few avenues through which you can contact us. We have an email address. There's our web page. Um, we're also on Twitter and Instagram and on Facebook. So that's all from me today. What I'll do is I'll hand over to Leah and John and we'll get stuck into date to today's webinar. So thank you. I will stop sharing my screen now and hand over. Thank you, Patrick, and I'll just share my screen. Okay, I think that should be working okay. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you to VFF for having us, John and I, here to speak about strategic management of internal parasites today. I'll uh, start off the uh, presentation and then John will follow uh, after about 20 minutes. So just uh, an outline of my presentation. Uh, so I'm gonna start off by talking about significant internal parasites in cattle. Then I'll go through some key points with the life cycle of these internal parasites. 
I'll then go on to talk about the diseases that they cause and then finish off my presentation with why internal parasites are important in cattle. So in southeastern Australia, there are a few significant internal parasites that can infect cattle. In this presentation, I'll focus mostly um, on the most pathogenic, so pathogenic of the roundworms and flatworms. You might be thinking that you've never heard of these terms. So a roundworm is what we'd consider as worms in cattle, and a flatworm is what we know to be fluke in cattle. Being familiar with uh, the different internal parasites can help uh, that infect cattle can help improve your understanding of the strategic management of these parasites, which John will speak more about. So this slide here gives an outline of the worms which can infect cattle and in some situations cause significant disease. So firstly, looking at uh, the first dot point there is Ostatagia ostatagi, which might otherwise be known as small brown stomach worm. It is one of the most pathogenic of the worm species to infect cattle and is the major production limiting parasite in young cattle in southeastern Australia. So it has a low egg output compared to the second species that I've got listed there, which is Cuperia oncophora, which is less pathogenic on its own, but has a higher egg output. So this is important because it means that low egg counts in feces can be quite significant. So I'll talk a bit more about egg counts later in this presentation. Like I mentioned, cuperia on its own may be less pathogenic, but can contribute to the severity of disease in a mixed infection. Other species of worms which can also infect cattle include Trichostrongulus axii and Homonchus contortus, so uh, Homonchus we otherwise know as Barber's pole worm. These are both of a lesser importance in cattle, but should be known because they can also infect sheep. So this is important if you're using sheep and cattle to graze the same pastures because cattle can be a major con contributor to the contamination of sheep pastures. Moving on to liver fluke. So liver fluke infection is widespread in cattle grazing areas where there is an average annual rainfall greater than 600 mil or irrigation country. However, just keep in mind that in Western Victoria, where there is higher rainfall, we're not likely to see uh, liver fluke in most areas because the groundwater is often too salty, uh, which doesn't suit the survival of liver fluke. Cattle infected with liver fluke can go undiagnosed because there is no obvious, often no obvious clinical signs with reduced weight gains being one of the impacts. Strategic management of liver fluke is not straightforward because part of the life cycle needs to be completed in a snail. Therefore, the seasonal occurrence of the snail also needs to be considered. So it's important to discuss the life cycle of internal parasites so that it's easier to understand the basis behind strategic management. All of the worms that infect cattle have a simple and direct life cycle. So just talking about worms here. Uh, I'll speak mostly about Ostatagia here because it's the most important in relation to the impact on production and has also been studied in the most detail. When discussing the life cycle of internal parasites, a point to consider is that there can be lengthy delays um, in some parts of the life cycle, influenced mainly by the weather and cattle in the case of worms or ostatagia. One of the key elements to enable completion of the worm life cycle is moisture. So looking at the life cycle, adult worms live in the abomasum or otherwise the fourth stomach. Uh, some of the other species can live in the small intestines. The female ostatagia can lay between 50 to 100 eggs per day, which are deposited onto the ground in feces. The eggs will then hatch within the faecal pat. And once the larvae hatch, they go through a number of larval stages within the faecal pat uh, before becoming infective larvae. These will migrate out of the faecal pat and onto pastures, which are then ingested by cattle. So a little bit more detail about a few of the stages. Once the eggs have been excreted in feces, the time taken until the eggs hatch will depend on the ambient, ambient temperature and moisture in the feces. They need warmth and oxygen to hatch. Therefore, the time taken 
to hatch varies greatly depending on the time of year. So in summer, it can take as, as short as four to 12 days, whereas in winter, when it's cool and soggy and, and the faecal pats are lacking oxygen, it can take five to 10 weeks. Once the larvae hatch and develop into infective larvae, they can remain within the faecal pats for long periods of time. So over the warmer months, they can remain here for five months. This is in contrast to when we're look, talking about sheep worms, which once de deposited in feces over the summer period are likely to be killed uh, by the heat of the sun and, and the faecal pellet drying out before uh, the sheep can consume them. So this is, in, this is why summer drenching is so effective, effective at managing worms in sheep, but in cattle, due to the survival of worms over the summer in faecal pats, uh, summer drenching is not effective. Moisture is essential to soften faecal pats enough to enable larval migration. However, sporadic summer storms may often, uh, or are not often enough to soak the entire faecal pat. So some larvae in the outer crust may migrate out, but they'll be killed off by the drying effects of the sun. Consistent rainfall at the autumn break will see more infective larvae migrate from softened faecal pats with peak numbers on pastures six to eight weeks following the autumn break. And these larvae can survive outside the faecal pat for longer because of the cooler weather. Uh, and so they'll survive through until it starts to heat up. Once they're ingested by the cattle, it takes three weeks to, um, for the uh, infective larvae to become egg laying adults. So looking at the life cycle of fluke now, uh, so there are two important requirements for the fluke life cycle. Um, and this is a specific snail, which uh, the fluke needs to complete part, part of its life cycle in, and an environment that is suitable for the fluke eggs, snail and the immature fluke. Suitable areas for the snail include slow moving fresh water, such as streams or springs, uh, leakages from dam banks. Uh, they're unlikely to be found in permanent still water bodies, uh, such as your troughs, um, stagnant dams and stagnant lagoons. The adult liver fluke live in the bile ducts and can live there for many years if untreated. The female can lay many eggs, so 20,000 to 50,000 eggs per day. Uh, and if you think about it, this is a significant contributor to pasture contamination. The eggs are deposited onto the uh, pastures and feces, uh, the eggs hatch and the young fluke um, move out of the feces and invade the snail. Within the snail, the fluke develops through a number of stages uh, and then the young fluke leaves the snail and insists on the pastures. And this is the infective stage to cattle. Cattle become infected after ingesting this stage um, and then the fluke open up, so exist in the small intestine penetrate through the gut lining and make their way to the liver. They migrate through the liver to the bile duct where the life cycle is complete. Also keep in mind when considering um, trying to reduce contamination in pastures that wildlife can also be a major contributor to pasture contamination because the adult fluke can also live in wildlife. So deer and wombat, mice, um, et cetera. So once again, a little bit more detail about the liver fluke life cycle. Uh, so like I mentioned, uh, need a suitable environment uh, for different stages of the life cycle. Eggs in feces require a wet area to hatch and temperatures over 10 degrees, meaning that in summer, eggs can hatch after 21 days, whereas in winter, it may take as long as 90 days. Once the young fluke enters the snail, it can remain here for a long period of time if the environmental conditions on the outside um, don't suit. And once temperatures start to increase, it will leave the snail. Once the uh, fluke has insisted on the pastures, it can survive for weeks unless high temperatures, temperatures. dried out. This means that the period when there is a peak number of infective larvae available to get cattle is from late spring through until late autumn. There's a period in the middle of summer where it may be too hot for the larvae to survive on the pastures. And so there may be reduced intake over this period. 
Uh, once FLUC are ingested, it takes eight to 10 weeks before they become egg laying adults. So moving on to looking at the types of disease that uh, firstly worms cause. So the first one that we're gonna look at is type one, uh, osteotagiasis. And this occurs in young cattle up to 15 to 18 months of age. So it occurs uh, over winter and spring after the uh, young cattle ingest a large number of infective larvae over a short period of time. So the infective larvae are ingested and over a period of three to four weeks, they become adults, which then uh, and in that process damage the gut lining and the function of the gut, which re uh, results in scouring, reduced weight gains and weight loss. If this was occurring in the mob, a large number of the mob would be affected. So between August and December, when some of these larvae are picked up, they start they can start to become dormant in the gut lining and lay there uh, dormant for three to nine months. So then thinking about these larvae, type two is when there is a massive emergence of these dormant larvae. And these complete their life cycle becoming adults and in the process damaging the gut lining, causing scouring, weight loss and bottle jaw as seen in this animal cow here on the right. It will often happen in um, so young heifers, two, rising two to three year old heifers, which is exacerbated by calving, and we'd see this in the autumn period. It can have and can also happen be seen in bulls or any age group of animals that are um, under stress. Type two would be seen in a smaller number of animals in the mob as compared to type one. Looking at the types of disease that is caused by liver fluke. So there's acute and chronic. So acute uh, occurs um, when cattle take on a large number of infective fluke. And this period, like I said before, is from late spring through to late autumn. And the infective larvae uh, migrate out of the gut lining and through the liver. And on doing so, so cause severe liver damage, which can lead to hemorrhage and sudden death. This is acute is less likely to be seen in cattle, more likely to see the chronic form, which is when the adult fluke live in the bile duct and suck blood. Clinical signs here develop more slowly and the clinical signs that we're likely to see is severe anemia, so pale gums or pale uh, around the eyes uh, and bottle jaw and weight loss. One, another disease which is uh, associated with the migrating liver th fluke through the liver is black disease. So black disease is um, sudden death due to uh, clostridial disease, uh, clostridial uh, bacteria. And so the clostridial spores uh, lay dormant in the liver. And then after damage from the migrating liver fluke, uh, release a toxin which can cause sudden death. So uh, just finishing up with why are worms important? So I guess an important, what I would like you to really take away from these next two slides is that uh, low worm egg counts and clinical appearance of the cattle are not good indicators of when uh, cattle are infected um, with worms and when to drench. So this figure here is showing, uh, was from a trial that was completed by the McKinnon Project in 2010 and 11. And there was four groups of spring-born weaners that were drenched in May. And they, th there was a control group, which is the blue, which was untreated, and then three treatment groups. And it's showing that, so at a low egg count, so 61 eggs per gram, and all these animals look clinically normal, there was still a weight difference between treated and untreated of about 30 to 50 kilograms per head. Also note that this, the period of this weight gain was from autumn, so May through till November. So an autumn weaning through, May's a bit late, but an autumn weaning through to, to spring, November. Uh, another slide, this is the same project, but 
completed in East Gippsland. And this is just showing a weight gain difference of um, half a kilo per head per day over that period. So that period from late autumn through to early spring is really important period for young cattle because you want heifers to be growing to reach their critical mating weight. And you also want steers to be growing at their best so that you can sell them at, um, uh, to slaughter at, at 15 months of age or to feed lots. And then why is fluke important? So in young cattle, it causes reduced growth rates. Uh, in a study that was done, well, this was back in the 70s, it showed um, over a six month period, uh, reduced weight gains in young cattle with a mild infection of 8% up to 27% with a heavy infection. Uh, and when you uh, relate that to the growth that you would expect in cattle over that period, it could be an eight to 40 kilo uh, reduction. Um, less likely that in old cattle would be just a weight loss, so less important, but then, um, and then to the industry, uh, awful condemnation, so a loss to the industry as a whole. So finally, in summary, for my part of the talk, uh, I guess three things. So understand that the life cycle of these internal parasites, because as John will go on to talk about, this is important to be able to understand the strategic management of these parasites. Also recognise in most situations, there may not be obvious clinical signs, uh, but we're still having an impact on the potential weight gains. And this is, um, and so animals that look healthy and have a low egg count may not be growing at their potential. So I'll finish there and I'll stop sharing. Okay, um, if I um, take over now, it's John Webb, we're speaking. Thanks, Leah, for that. And look, what I'm going to talk about, firstly, uh, before talking about um, sort of management of worm control, I want to talk a bit about um, uh, the uh, emerging resistance issue in uh, cattle. And it's uh, it's a really important issue, and I'm particularly going to focus on worms here, but it's also an issue with um, fluke as well, but we have less of a handle on it. And then I want to talk a bit about strategic drenching and, and, and management of worms in cattle. So first, first in, I mean, look, at the end of the day, drench resistance has been an ongoing um, problem um, in, in sheep since the 1980s. But Look, it's starting to be really well documented in cattle. Um, there's been evidence in dairy cattle for quite some time, partly because they drench young cattle so much, uh, but there's also widespread emergence in beef cattle in New Zealand, Europe, USA, wherever you look, you find it where they've been using drenches for some time. Um, in terms of um, in Australia, it, it's definitely there. We've, we've been seeing it for um, some time at low levels. But, um, um, and the thing is that, why is it happening? Well, partly because, I mean, the macrocyclic lact lactones, so all the um, abamectin, moxidectin type drenches have for, for many years now been the primary drench used um, for, for many times. So little variation in product, um, which has been um, uh, certainly an important issue. In terms of, but why has it taken so long to develop compared to sheep? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, we drench cattle on average in high rainfall areas a lot less frequently than we do with sheep. And also there's an issue, and, and Leah talked about it, in, uh, mentioned it with regard to uh, mm -hmm. dung pats. In, in cattle dung pats, it's quite a good environment for, dung, uh, for worm larvae to survive for longer periods than in sheep. And so we're not getting the same selection pressure in, in cattle than it, that we do with sheep over the summer period because there's better survival of worm larvae on, on pastures with cattle compared to sheep. Um, but, and not, but one of the issues too, I, I think, is that for, from a diagnostic point of view, it's a lot trickier to do um, egg counts on, on cattle than it is with sheep. And the most important worm, um, Ostertagia, 
is is does have quite low egg output and can, can be overwhelmed when you do total uh, the egg counts then be overwhelmed with uh, cuperia which are much more prolific egg layer um, and also the other thing in in in, in cattle, it is a bit of an issue with sheep as well, in that um, uh, worm egg counts after, particularly after 12 to 15 months, can be pretty unreliable. Um, and as you can see from that data that Leah showed, that even with quite low egg counts, uh, production losses do occur. Um, and also, just given the value of animals, there's, there's less um, likely when, when we do post, we do less post mortem so and, and total worm counts in cattle to understand what what species uh, of worm are present. It's a lot more difficult and cumbersome to do total worm counts in, in cattle compared to sheep. So there's a number of issues. One of there's real issues why resistance is delayed, but also there's a diagnostic issue too. It's a bit trickier in cattle compared to sheep, but that's not to say that it can't be done. So um, in the first instance, um, uh, if we've got an egg count in, in uh, calves at weaning and weaning, uh, weaning when calves haven't been drenched or shouldn't have been drenched at that point in time. Um, if we've got egg counts above a couple of hundred eggs per gram, but even if they're a bit lower than that, we can do, um, uh, we, we, we can set up a, um, a, a drench trial and, and, and without explaining in any detail, typically because the high, uh, lower egg counts, we like more weaners per group. So 15, 20 weaners per group. And, We've always got to have a control on treated group, and then we might use a mecton drench, and then a white drench, uh, and a clear drench, just to see uh, uh, it with with three different groups. So I mean, we need between sixty and eighty weaners. But if you're just checking your mectons, you only need uh, thirty to forty weaners. Um, and we'd click uh, collect individual fecal samples um, um, after about a ten to fourteen days post treatment and compare the treatment groups with the control group to, to determine what sort of egg reduction we've had. Also, I think it's quite important to do larval cultures in the different groups to determine, uh, differentiate what worm species we're dealing with, because you might say, oh yeah, we've got resistance, but I mean, is it resistance to bar, uh, to, to um, Ostertagia, or is it resistance to Peria or one of the other uh, 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 worm species? I mean, just a this is the sort of most recent data we have in terms of how widespread it is. Um, I mean, and, and this is pretty, and, and a lot of producers haven't done any drench trials, but I mean, the, 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 in Victoria, we found 66% of um, producers have uh, at, uh, resistance to at least one drench group. In Western Australia, it was up close to 90%. In New Zealand was the same, but over 90% of uh, properties had resistance to at least one drench product. And most commonly, Obviously, it's the mecton type drenches which um, have have issues. But um, and but if we just look at what worm species, if we nail it down a bit more detail, um, um, in in uh, Ostertagia, six out of thirty uh, uh, trials were uh, Ostertagia was resistant to either mecton. In New Zealand, it was um, eight out of thirty to uh, white uh, white drench. And, and nine, sorry, that's Victorian data. And nine out of sixteen were resistant to labamisole. Um, and, and with caperia, it was over half were uh, resistant or half were the resistant to the mectins, but less to the uh, white trench and labamisole. Um, the trichostrongulus or stomach hairworm, uh, there was low level of resistance, um, um, and a, but a combined avamectin labamisole was 100% effective, um, which was good news. So combinations are real value. Um, porons and uh, some uh, uh, and, and long acting poron or injectable products, uh, the results were more uh, variable. But it's interesting in one New Zealand study showed that um, oral moxidectin or cydectin was much more effective than um, the poron was the worst um, in terms of uh, level of resistance detected, or you might even argue efficacy. Uh, uh, compared to injectable was more effective than poron, but the oral formulation was the most effective. Now that was measuring um, resistance in cuperia, and, um, and, and it might be a little bit different, but it has, I'm not aware it's been tested um, with um, uh, ostertagia, which uh, the mechanism of feeding is slightly different, whereas uh, cuperia very much in the uh, lumen of the 
um, small intestines. But it just does highlight that um, the oral formulation was the most effective in those studies. So be mindful of that information as well. This is just some trials we did at McKinnon Project some years ago. And, um, the, and the definition of a resistance is where um, uh, the drench must be more than 95% effective. And you can see there's a red line going across there, which shows that. And you can see um, the, what, the, the, the property, there's 10 properties here, and the first five properties just compared, uh, looked at um, white drench and mectin efficacy. And you can see that uh, there was only one out of the first five properties was uh, the mectins were fully effective. The rest, there was um, reduction. Initially, when these products came out, they were pretty much close to 100%. So even if it's a bit at 98%, it's the first signs of resistance is to, starting to emerge. But you can see there's properties down at 85% um, um, and the low 80% efficacy. Um, but similar pattern with um, the white trenches, so it's slightly more effective perhaps overall than the mectins. And labamisole, some, uh, one property there was 100% and another property 98 or 99% and then a few properties down at uh, 90%. So you can see, unfortunately, it is, is an, an issue across, across uh, the drench groups. Um, here's an individual trial where we, we, we sifted, just um, differentiated the different worm species present with larval cultures and the control group only had 94 eggs per gram. Um, but the white, white drench was 99% effective. There was only one positive. Abermectin was 100% and ivermectin was 86% effective. Now, I mean, we, we found ivermectin is the, is the least potent of the mectins consistently. And nowadays, I, I personally am not a big fan of recommending ivermectin when, um, when the mectins are used. I'd prefer um, uh, one of the other mectin uh, groups. And in terms of uh, theoretically, abermectin is more potent than ivermectin, which and moxidectin, doramectin, and epronex are um, slightly more potent than abermectin. But to be perfectly honest, I haven't found a big difference between abermectin, moxidectin, doramectin, and, and epronectin. And, and so, but I've, I've talked about that injectable versus poron versus oral, and certainly it seems some evidence would be. Um, are also uh, the slightly more effective. One thing about the MLs, they are e e effective against an in inhibited larvae. Um, now, I just want to mention the white trenches, which used to be the main uh, source of control before the uh, mechanisms came out, is that it is also in uh, effective against inhibited larvae. Uh, and it is a very useful alternative to the MLs. Now, clear trenches uh, are not infective uh, effective against uh, Ostertagia larvae in the gut lining. And the reason is that the, these, um, that, that drench group just causes temporary paralysis of the worm. So it just, it, um, uh, it, they, the worms, when they're exposed to the chemical, they just pass through the lumen and out, out the back end. Uh, whereas uh, MLs and white, uh, white drenches actually kill, kill the worms, sort of, sort of thing. So the reason, so it, 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 the Levanazole isn't effective uh, against um, for adult cattle when we're trying to deal with type two osteogia. But I think the really important message I wanna uh, uh, talk about now is that um, there's commercial uh, 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 poron, uh, which, which do have combinations of um, levamisole and, and abamectin, and there's a couple of, um, and so uh, you could either use um, use individual drenches as a combination or some of the commercial. Um, there is, I think, trifecta at this stage, and I've just forgotten off the top of my head, as a triple combination, which is, is a sheep drench, but it's also registered for use in cattle, as well as a triple. And I think uh, we'll find that using um, the, the registered uh, triple products in, in future will be really valuable um, as an alternative uh, where we've just historically relied on the ML drenches. So I think, the triple combinations are an important, um, or even the double combinations are an important tool for you, for future. In terms of managing trench resistance, I mean, there's a couple of simple uh, principles which we should follow, weigh and dose to the heaviest in the mob. Um, uh, check that your drench applicator is giving the correct nose, a dose. I always recite a, 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 a field day that I also have enough people to bring along drench guns, and this was with sheep, but it's actually exactly the same with cattle. 
And I think um, there was 19 producers brought along uh, dredge guns and, and there was only a couple of them uh, were delivering the correct dose, which was a bit scary. So um, the other thing, so use the correct dose and weight of the heaviest dose to the heaviest in the mob. Um, now you can, uh, some people individually weigh cattle as they go through the crush and drench according to dose and there's automated systems for that and that's fine, okay? Um, but but don't underdose um, animals um, is the critical message. Um, and make sure that the uh, guns are delivering the correct dose. Um, the other thing with cattle, it's, it's important not to overdrench. And I think the most common overdrenching I see is perhaps with young calves drenched, which uh, 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 when cows lactating shouldn't need to be drenched. And the other time is fat older cows sometimes um, or quite commonly drenched when they don't need to be drenched too. Uh, so, um, but there's, uh, and I'll talk about timing of drenches in a minute. And also, um, I think we should in, from now on be testing our drench resistance status. Even in the first instance, without doing a full drench trial, just check 10 to 14 days post drenching of a group to make sure it's gone back to zero. And if it hasn't gone back to zero, then you need to um, have, a, have a closer look. I think the, the use of combinations in future, and certainly a lot of people up with I deal with now, are using combination trenches rather than the MLs alone. If you are using ML, MLs, I prefer not to use either neck. And also I think a couple of things, quarantine drenching, if you're trading cattle or buying cattle, and the, it's not negotiable to use triple combinations in that sort of situation. Um, and I, I, as with sheep, I, I like an annual rotation of effective trenches probably functions for um, cattle at this stage, but I think that's uh, certainly worth considering as well. If there is a few options, and 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 also, yeah, like I said, with quarantine drenching, using the triple combinations. Also, uh, monitor post drench, and also uh, if, if if cattle have come from a fluky potential fluky area, check for fluke as well, because there's widespread resistance, particularly to trichlorpendazole or fasmix, um, with fluke because it's been the primary drench for such a long time. And there's certainly resistance in some areas worse than others. Okay, um, and, and, a, um, and, and a couple of issues before finish, finishing up on resistance is that look, production consequences appear to be only moderate at this stage, um, uh, but I think they will gradually um, increase uh, if we don't understand what our resistance status is. I think long acting products, which some people rely on in, in young cattle, I think. Um, I think they're a really good product, but I think relying on them really makes uh, worries me because any worms which provide that drench is likely to provide the basis of uh, a resistant worm population in future. And I think the other thing is it's critical to uh, grazing management, I'll expand on that in a minute, to um, particularly a sheep cattle swap over if you have got sheep, but um, or at least at the very least, keep the young stock, which are the most at risk, away from the uh, wormy paddocks as much as possible. The other thing I just want to finish up with here is just a comment on Barber's pole worm um, that is much more of an issue in sheep than cattle. Um, but young cattle in particular can carry Barber's pole worm and those Barber's pole can re reproduce in cattle. So we've seen a number of places where they've bought cattle from particularly the Tablelands in New South Wales where they drench a lot for Barber's pole and the Barber's pole are resistant very commonly resistant to the mectins. They drench them when they come home with a mectin trench and think they've done the right thing, but unfortunately they haven't killed the barber's pole. So I think it's, it just re-emphasizes that point where triple combinations are a much more reliable thing to kill those uh, barber's pole worms. And I think I've seen, and I do see a few places where they have introduced barber's pole. It isn't causing huge problems, but uh, it's primarily causing high egg counts as much as anything without clinical disease because the environment's not quite super, suitable. But it's a real pain if you've got it on your property and prefer not to have it, um, uh, as the people who have got it could, uh, would agree. So combination drenches of very introduced cattle, I, I think young cattle in particular are really important. I just want to talk about the key elements of worm control now briefly. Um, and, and I'll just break it down into a few different elements. One is strategic drenching at a time when worms are most vulnerable, rather than just reactive drenching when you've got worms. I think prevention is better than cure. Uh, monitoring, I've, 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 I've been 
uh, um, very cynical of women counts. Uh, they are of some use, but shouldn't be relied on at, at, as the sole decision-making criteria. Grazing management, I think it's really important. The principle of keep the young stock away from wormy paddocks and finally understand what your drench resistance status is. Okay, so the, the principle with strategic drenching is to maintain low worm larvae contamination on pastures. And, and so you're trying to time the drenches when they have a, a, a big biggest impact rather than relying on a curative approach. And, and the other part, which is really important um, with particularly with young cattle is, is, is good nutrition. I mean, there's nothing like good nutrition and research shows it really well that if cattle have got good nutrition, it's not the sole panacea to control worms, but it does really help with the animal to resilience for worms. Um, and obviously the timing uh, of drenches will depend on the local environment timing carving, but I'll talk about that timing now. So I've just talked, just initially, I'm just showing you a spring carving herd here where, and I'll work through with weaners. So, uh, and then weaners, the yearlings, and then the uh, first and second carvers and mature cows and bulls. So with regard to weaners, um, and this is in the typical Victorian environment, um, uh, above a 600 mil rainfall. In some of the northern lower rainfall areas, the frequency of drenching doesn't need to be as great. But are not negotiable for, for the above 600 mil rainfall, uh, where cattle are the primary enterprise is, is drench at weaning. And now that will depend on the year, but it might be as early as January, but as late as April um, uh, for spring carvers, uh, drench at weaning. And then a second drench will be late May to early June. And a third drench will be uh, late July into August. Now, in high rainfall areas and really tough years, there may require a spring drench, but it would be based on a year by year situation. So they're the critical drenches for the high, higher rainfall areas. Now, you might tweak that, that last drench may not be metered, but most spring carvers, they're still only just rising 12 months old then, and they're still pretty vulnerable to worms. But once the feed gets away in spring, you're better off. So, so that's up to the first um, summer. So that um, uh, January period, I'm talking about pregnant heifers now. I think they do need a summer drench, um, um, not so much from a control of worms on pastures because they survive in worms survive in dung pads, but to remove worms which have been picked up over spring. And as Leah said, they become inhibited in the gut lining and they emerge over autumn. And we've seen this time and time again. And so I think for a summer a drench for the uh, pregnant heifers, but also for the um, first calving heifers with a first calf at foot, um, definitely warrant to have that drench over um, uh, that summer period, no earlier than January. Ideally, um, if you go into March, there's a risk that they might break down with type two ostatagi again. So I prefer January, February for that drench. And if it can coincide with weaning for them, that's great. Okay. Now I've said um, that's a not negotiable for those uh, first and second carvers, but in winter is a pre-carving drench for the first carvers. Look, if you're in a drought situation and it's really short feed, heifers are below their desirable condition note, then sure that um, a drench pre-carving will be beneficial for that cohort. But if they're in good condition on adequate pasture, you probably won't need that drench. Um, for mature cows, a summer drench, a late summer, early autumn. On some properties, we have to drench spring cows annually because they've had a consistent history of type 2 ostatagia. Um, and so just remember that needs to be a mecton or a white drench or a combination of both. Uh, but uh, some, sometime uh, in many years when cows are in really good condition, they won't need a drench. Now, I just went onto a property last week which had, had um, uh, just getting some type 2 ostatagia happening now in mature cows, which is unusual for that property, but um, but it is happening. And perhaps there's been a higher parasite load picked up, up over the last two years, complements of the good seasonal conditions. So I've recommended them giving a, a, um, a summer drench to all, all the cows. Um, bulls seem, I mean, there's a trial which was never published, but it shows that bulls carry double the parasite burden of the equivalent age steers. Uh, it must be the hormonal effects and the stress or something with bulls, but they're much more vulnerable to type 2 off the tiger and worms in general. So we recommend a summer drench and also a winter drench. That 
May, June, and possibly be a bit earlier, but but in higher rainfall areas, um, I think um, they are more vulnerable to worms. So I think it's worth doing. For the autumn calves, it is slightly different for the weaners. We trench um, when we wean them, whenever that is, November, December. Um, 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 and then they're a bit older at that stage. Uh, over, so they're one year old in, in, in by March when they haven't, shouldn't have picked up too many more, more worms. And, uh, but May, June is uh, when they're rising 15 months. Now, I mean, if you've got steers, they should be drenched then. Um, and for heifers, uh, which are gonna be joined then, they should get that drench. So to me, it's a not negotiable drench. So late May, June is a pre-joining sort of uh, drench would be reasonable timing. Because they're older, they're more resilient to the worms over winter, whereas the spring calves babies, whereas these are, um, uh, 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 six months older at this stage. So I would only drench late late winter where it's been a really tough year, okay? Now you can do egg counts and that sort of stuff, but but just be careful that a low egg count isn't the panacea um, of, of deciding to drench. Um, um, now, the first and second carvers is not negotiable to give that summer drench to. Now, it, it, it just to prevent type two ostodagia where the risk is highest. Um, I occasionally spot drench um, cows in skinny condition in winter without doing the whole lot. Okay, with with uh, mature cows, um, there's some places we drench routinely for mature cows in summer as a pre-calving drench to stop type two, um, and and some places the, the history that we it says we don't. It's it's a matter, but we might do it in a drought year where cows are in a lot lighter condition uh, to uh, get rid of all the inhibit larvae and under more stress and more likely to break down, okay? So that, that's the basic principles uh, of, um, of, of drenching um, uh, your two different herds. Now, with regard to worm egg counts, the younger the animal is, the more useful it might be, but over 12 months, it gets really dodgy. Just remember, you might be overwhelmed with caperia and, and not the most important one. Uh, but I mean, if you do do them, uh, just, have a really close look at the animals. And if you're not drenching young cattle less than 12 months of age over winter, and th th those trials which we did, um, which Leah showed before, there was really interesting that they were, um, they, those cattle, the farmer was adamant that they didn't need a drench. And they looked really well, and they still got that half kilogram a day growth response. So, um, I mean, at the very least, if you're not drenching young cattle over winter at all, just uh, compare with a treated, untreated group to see uh, if you do get a response. Blood tests can be useful for um, older cattle to check gut damage, uh, but it's a, a veterinary sort of, a, a sort of diagnostic tool, but that can be useful to check gut damage of older cattle. Uh, and I think just uh, don't just rely on egg counts. I think really look closely at how the animal's performing. Are there, is there a lot of scouring in these animals and so on? But if you keep the broad thrust of those, those control times, I said, you, you should, a pretty good control. Um, and I think grazing management is really important. I emphasize keeping young stock away from the wor uh, wormy paddocks. Now, short term rotational grazing is of little value for, uh, uh, for worm control because, the, the, particularly over the cooler periods, the worm larvae will survive five to 10 weeks, uh, three months, four months quite comfortably. Um, low risk paddocks would be new pastures fodder crops, hay and silage aftermaths can be okay, but just be careful if they had wormy cattle in winter. So if you're looking for weaning paddocks for cattle, um, it's particularly over the winter period. So you might have one level of weaning paddock at weaning, which is good quality pasture, and then they might move where the quality of most pasture is better in winter. Uh, just to avoid, avoid using paddocks, which have historically had wormy cattle in previous years is really important. Now it's tricky where you've just got cattle, but if you have got um, sheep, there is one free kick in agriculture and that's swapping sheep and cattle over every six months, drenching young cattle at the move and drenching sheep at the move. Both, if you swap over every six months, you'll get a really good benefit from parasite control for both sheep and cattle. It's a, re a real opportunity that lot, lot, not a lot of people use and exploit to their advantage. Okay. So with just briefly on fluke control, um, fluke's really an Eastern Victoria issue or an irrigation area. There's a few pockets in Western Victoria, but it's by far more common in Eastern Victoria. Uh, 
And it really, the time in the drenching depends on the cattle. Young cattle are certainly more at risk. Um, and sometimes on farm, sometimes it might be only one area, it might be the creek flats, or it might be an area where there's springs and the rest of the farm, no springs, no risk of fluke. Um, and so typically what we do in, in fluky areas, and this might be where I refer to a fluky area, it might be a farm with just three or four paddocks, which are at risk. Um, so late summer, early autumn, we, we drench calves at weaning typically. Um, and then, and also we might consider other groups if there's really high challenge, um, a young, uh, but younger cattle in particular over that period. Uh, later autumn and winter, we might drench, re-drench young cattle again, uh, but uh, a worm egg count um, to indicate what's going on with uh, mobs you're not sure about. Um, uh, it might be a routine strategic drench um, in, in um, endemic areas where we know there's a lot of fluke and um, uh, from the history of the property. But I think monitoring is, is useful, but it, again, it's not the panacea, but it is useful to give a guide. You can do blood tests and fecal antigen tests and so on as well. But I think um, where, where mag counts are, are probably the most useful and, and practical uh, uh, method for fluke, fluke monitoring for most people. Um, there's, um, there's, um, um, and, and so with regard to when we, that winter drench, it's more a strategic drench when, when it gets cold, the cap is perhaps a bit lower. And also the cattle are less likely to be grazing in the swampy fluky areas uh, where the, 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 the fluke snail lives and their, their contamination is highest. So typically a winter clean out um, um, of, of, of fluke would be useful. So, I mean, some farms have been able to eradicate fluke, or I mean, there might be still fluke there because of wildlife, but, but keep the stock away from um, spring areas and where people have fenced off uh, creek frontages. Sometimes they've found that they haven't got any more fluke, um, which is a real bonus. Um, um, and so, but again, the principle is keep, keep the young stock off the highest risk areas. And, and but that must be balanced with nutrition because sometimes the creek flats are the best quality feed. So it's actually better to run them on the creek flats and uh, need to manage the fluke. Just want to make a few comments finishing up and through with regards to a few of the different products. The main one, triclobendazole, theoretically kills all stages of fluke. It comes as an oral, and that's, that does kill all stages. With a poron product, it only kills down to six, uh, six, to, uh, six weeks or so because just the concentration levels in the animal, I presume. Um, we know resistance is widespread. We haven't really looked at it in a widespread area. So just be mindful that um, triclobendazole or Fasinex is, is a good product. Uh, it, it, it used to kill all stages of fluke, but resistance is now widespread with it. Albendazole, Al which is one of the benzimidazole white trenches, uh, it does have some fluke activity, but it doesn't kill all fluke. Um, but it kills uh, fluke, um, adult fluke over 12, or over 12 weeks of age. Um, uh, resistance is present, uh, but also be mindful of even um, albendazole, even adults is not fully effective anyway. There's a few other ones, oxyclozonide plus uh, lamamazole. I think that's um, 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 uh, Nilzan uh, is one, uh, I think that's the trade name of one of the trade names. It only kills um, adult fluke. Uh, resistance is rare to oxyclozonide, but, but if you're doing a winter drench where you've got just adult, you're dealing with adults, primarily adult fluke, well, um, it might be an option. The other one, which is also very effective, it, it's a subcutaneous injection, is, is um, nitro, uh, nitroxanol and flocylon. Now, I think there's a couple of trade names come to mind. Um, nit nit Nitrofluke, I think it is, and then Nitromex got ivermectin as well. But again, I'm not a big fan of ivermectin as a product, but, uh, but it kills uh, larval stages right down to two weeks of age. So there is a, an, an alternative to relying on just triclopendazole, um, and, and no resistance has been recorded to that. Uh, that product it isn't used nearly as much, but it is an option. Okay, so that's quite brief in terms of what I've talked about. Um, have a revisit those slides where the timing of the drenches I think is important to consider. Um, strategic drenching, monitoring, grazing management, they're all important um, keys to effective uh, worm and fluke control.
Uh, look, drench resistance is widespread in cattle, we know, so understand the resistance status of your farm, minimise the uh, production losses and make sure you're using effective trenches. And importantly, keep resistance out of your trading cattle and buying cattle. Um, so I think we'll leave it there and, and open it up to uh, questions uh, if we go uh, back, Patrick, to, um, I, I guess you'll be, um, if there's any questions in, um, about, uh, about our talks, okay? Perfect. Thank you very much, Leah and John. Um, that was a great presentation. I'll just check the Q&A quickly. Um, I see there's been a question waiting there patiently. Um, but whilst we're going through any questions, um, I would just love to get some feedback from anyone still online. Um, we'll just activate another poll, which should be popping on, up on your screen any second now. Um, so if you just take the time to fill that out while we go through the Q&A, that would be fantastic. Um, so I believe we have a question here for Leah. Um, so Leah, do the activity of dung beetles breaking down the pat reduce the survival of worm larvae? Oh, I guess, uh, so theoretically, if it occurred during summer when they were breaking them down, I guess it would uh, reduce the survival of um, the larvae. But uh, John might know something yeah, more. Any papers or? Yeah, work? there is a bit of work, recent work on this actually. Um, now, in winter, it probably is not doing, and there's lots of different dung beetle species, which are, are just, they offer a lot of them active just for short periods over the year. Um, and some of them bury the dung quite a long way down. Now, certainly, if they bury the dung a long way down, they'll take some of the larvae out of, of action, but they, the larvae can still migrate, even if it's been buried, they, uh, buried deeply, they, it can still migrate back. And the other thing is that um, with um, um, the, the, the dung beetles in, 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 in summer, if they break down the dung, dung, then you're definitely going to get better kill of larvae on pastures because they've lost that protective environment. So as, as Leah intimated, so and uh, how much it actually, what, what uh, it, it can actually do in terms of what percentage reduction in worms numbers on pasture, we, we honestly don't know, but uh, or suffice to say, it's potentially significant. Now, just to remember that dung, as I said, not all dung, be, uh, uh, there's gaps in the cycles where there's not activity of dung beetles. So, um, it, it unfortunately usually won't happen all, all summer, um, the uh, protection of um, the dung beetles, but um, no, the, 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 um, the, the activity of dung beetles, but, but even so, yes, so the, the short answer is yes, there is a few potential um, uh, benefits uh, there, uh, but quantifying that I'm not quite sure. And relying on it, I guess. Is yeah, not yeah. But, but I think it is, it is, uh, I'd rather have it than not, put it that way. It's, uh, I think it, it is potentially material. Okay. Perfect. Perfect, thank you. Um, and we've just had another question pop through. So in a spring calving herd, drenching weaner cattle every two to three months from autumn through to spring, mm. is it worth using different drenches over that time period to reduce the res risk of resistance developing? Well, it's a, it's a good question. Um, my advice from a sheep perspective is two things. Most of the time we use combination products on, um, on, on sheep now um, um, anyway, uh, rather than the individual products. So and my advice for cattle where possible, um, use combination products um, is, is probably, it is a, a useful tool where you've got two active chemicals um, working now my preference would be use a triple product and they only come as an oral formulation um, uh, so um, um, I, th I think um, my preference is to use triples now some people the concept of oral drenching really scares them in cattle um, and that might be quite fair enough with dodgy yards and that sort of stuff but I've had a number of clients are finding that uh, using their oral so what, they're really happy with it with power doses um, it's a lot, a lot easier than what it used to be. Uh, but back to the original question, I think that um, um, uh, what I advise in sheep is an annual rotation of effective drenches. So 
that would be my preference actually to have that annual rotation of effective trenches rather than just relying on the maintenance. Uh, but at, at, there's a very minimum to because we haven't got the uh, things like StarTech and Zolvix aren't registered in cattle. Zolvix doesn't work uh, quite as well against uh, Barbers, not Barbers Pole, doesn't work quite as well against, um, um, against um, uh, what you might call it, um, against um, uh, Ostatagia for some reason, unfortunately. Um, but uh, so we haven't got those groups to, to go to. So essentially we've got sort of in cattle, it's effectively a few different combinations of mectins and so on, whether it be just say an abomectin or bamisol, and then next year you go to a triple with a white trench um, in there and, and, and so on. So uh, I'm, I'm answering in a bit of a long-winded way, but yeah, I, I do like um, rotation of effective trenches, but I don't think there's much point of swapping from one to another to another in the same year. I think you're better off just sticking with that triple for the whole year is my preference rather than chopping and changing. Um, uh, and then go the next next year to another, uh, another another product. But I think and the long and the short is triples are much more preferable to individual products. Given we're just at that cusp of resistance um, at low levels, it won't be too long before we find on some properties vectors uh, their efficacy is very poor. And that's what I'm really concerned about, given we haven't got quite the product range that we have in sheep. We've been able to manage it very effectively in sheep, but it's been really useful to have a couple more products available to us. Okay. Perfect, thank you. Um, and we've just had another question just come through. Um, so in Feb, March calving of Angus Frisian cross cows, uh, Salville is go age 10 months over the hooks august oral drench of calves better than pour on to kick them into spring calves have greater than 1.5 kilograms head per day weight gain leading up to weighing in december uh, wec low slash nil cows in september so i don't drench the cows at all any comment on that yeah look it's an interesting one um uh, one comment I can make is is milk is a wonderful wonderful uh, antiemetic, and there's some research which shows that uh, when cows are lactating well. Now, one thing I do know is that those uh, Frisian cross cows do lactate really well, and so they're protected. Now, I guess in principle I'd say don't drench, but here's what an option if if you're wondering um, if you're nervous about not drenching them. Um, um, why don't you have an undrenched group uh, of, of in one particular mob, and pre preferably the mob which is doing its hardest is 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 trench um, um, uh, half and leave the others undrenched, and weigh them at the start, reweigh them after say a month or so to or, or six weeks uh, to see whether there's a different weight gain. The more you have in those two groups to compare the better, the more accurate the results um, uh, or the more power you have in interpreting those results. So in principle, they shouldn't need a drench, uh, but I'd have no problems uh, with, uh, with doing a, a little trial and it doesn't cost you anything apart from the bit of time to, to measure that. And so, you know, for future use. I mean, I've, the only times I've actually measured growth rate responses in calves where on lactating cows or, is when the cows have been in really poor condition and the calves should have been weaned. Now, with that uh, Vela, high, really high production Vela model, that one thing with the key to success of that, it's really good nutrition. Um, and um, I, I think that that's a, um, uh, that's a, um, uh, uh, a, a, a really important part of the protection against worms. I do think with that really high production, heavy lactation animal, I'm, I'm inclined to drench them pre-carving with those ones to prevent type 2 ostatagia. But I certainly agree with your observations that, well, you don't drench the cows. But I, I would say, if you do a, a, a worm egg count, you find they're low. Now, it's a, they will be low, almost certainly. Uh, but if you've got an individual cow, which is in really poor condition, I'm, I've got no problems with spot drenching that individual cow. It might, might have lost its um, immunity, but theoretically the calves shouldn't need uh, a drench, but I, I'd be interested to see if you could get a growth response uh, there in doing it. 
Perfect. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, so I think we might end up wrapping that up there. I will also note we do have uh, a recording of this, which we will send out to everybody who has registered. Uh, and if you do have any further questions or anything, you can get in touch with um, StockSense team uh, and we can definitely um, pass you through to Leah or John. Um, so just on behalf of StockSense, I just wanted to thank John and Leah and the McKinnon Project for coming along today and sharing the wealth of knowledge that they have available. I'd uh, also like to thank everyone online today for taking the time to engage with StockSense. Um, and we will conclude this webinar uh, and hopefully see you at a future event. Um, but just before we do, I've just seen one last question, which I will address um, that's come through. It's just a quick question around how do you do a, wor a worm egg count? Normally, um Sorry, I'll, I'll answer it. Um, normally, what you do is you pick up um, at least 10 fresh, warm faecal samples from, um, from animals. Now, we have little trays which you pop the faecal samples in, and you um, can take that to there's various uh, worm egg counting services across the state. Um, uh, we actually train up a number of our clients to do their own worm egg counts as well, where they're doing a lot of them. In cattle, you're probably not going to do as much, so whether that's worthwhile. But I mean, you, you can be trained up to do them yourself. But technically, it's not a difficult thing to do. Most people, they think, oh, yeah, we'll do this. We'll save a bit of money by doing it. it, it they cost about 35 bucks sort of retail to get a worm test done, usually or thereabouts. Um, so, uh, but I mean, some people, they think, oh yeah, they'll do their own. And then they start doing them and they think, no, nah, this is easier to get it done. But I mean, one advantage of doing it yourself and you need a microscope, uh, a good quality microscope and, and a mixer um, and, and some special jars um, uh, and, and, and so on and uh, special slides. And and it, 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 it sort of, it's a, a, there is kits around uh, which uh, you can buy, um, but um, but like, like I said, it, it's some people are good with it, uh, others find and it's really useful saying, no, I'm worried about these, just grabbing the faecal samples and, and, and doing them. When, when you actually get a result, what, what happens is that those individual faecal samples are mixed together in equal proportions. Um, and so you get a bulk count. Um, sometimes when we're doing checking drench efficacy, we do individual counts. Um, uh, uh, to see what the range of results are, because uh, if you get all um, all zeros and then one really high, that might suggest that there was one trench was missed or something like that. Um, so it's useful to do individuals, but with usually with routine monitoring, we do bulk, bulk samples. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, as I said, I'd just like to give one last thing. Thanks to Leah and John and the McKinnon Project for. Uh, generously sharing their time with us today. We do greatly appreciate it. Uh, and to everyone online, we do look forward to seeing you out at any future event we have. Uh, and yes, if you do have any questions or anything, please feel free to reach out and get in touch. Other than that, I will conclude the webinar here and uh, yeah, hopefully see everyone out and about in the future. Thank you.